Hey, welcome back to Robot Cantina. Today we're going to finish the EFI install, and if we're lucky we'll have a running fuel-injected cement mixer engine by the end of the episode. I also have the results of an experiment we conducted before the EFI swap, so you definitely want to watch the whole video, because you don't want to miss any of this. So let's get started. So here's the little 420cc Hemi that got the car up to 64 miles per hour on a straight and level road, which is pretty impressive because the engine is more or less stock. Actually, we did upsize the carburetor jet, and that was due to the less restrictive exhaust. While the high-speed performance is pretty good, we still need to go a little bit faster, and it would be nice to improve our 0 to 30 times. Currently, the car takes 11 seconds to accelerate to 30 miles per hour, or 48 kph for the metric crowd. Anyway, that's way too slow. This is kind of a sad moment, but we're about to take this very reliable 420 Hemi to the next level with the cheapest EFI kit on eBay. Now so far we've bench tested the kit and built all the sub-assemblies, so I reckon it's time we go ahead and get her done. So the E in EFI means electronic, and that's going to be a problem. You see, this car ain't got no electricity except for the battery, and I reckon it's time we make some extra electricity, just to keep all the E's and the EFI working. Now this engine comes out of the box with one charging coil, and that should be plenty for a go-kart. But just in case, we're going to go ahead and drop in a second coil so we can run the engine and the turn signals at the same time. Now these charging coils are the first step in making electricity. There also needs to be a rectifier and a regulator, and that's not today's problem. My only concern right now is to put the second coil in, because once the engine's in the car, we won't be able to remove the flywheel. Now it's kind of ironic. This car started life in 2001 with a 144 volt battery and had enough electricity to power a small house. Now we'll be lucky if we can generate enough power to run the engine and a few accessories. We do have a plan B if necessary. Anyway, I think the rectifier and the regulator we'll eventually use is from a Kubota tractor. And I need to check that out, but like I said, that's a project for another day. So while we're here, let's take a look at the cooling fan that came with this engine. Now it does a great job keeping the temperatures low. I mean, technically this engine shouldn't be in the car in the first place, but it seems to work. So there was talk in the comment section about the neodymium magnet I put on the shaft collar. And the theory is, it may eventually fail due to heat. So I figured once we get the car up and running, I'd shoot it with an IR thermometer and see what temperature it's at. From past experience, shiny aluminum can give a false reading with the IR thermometer, so we're going to paint the shaft collar black. Ah crap, I thought I was painting it flat black. Well, semi-gloss will be fine, I think. In case you haven't noticed, we're working on the actual engine from the car and not the new engine that we used in the last video. The new engine is for phase two of this project and we'll get to that some other day. Anyway, all the work we did setting up the timing has to be done over again, but it's good practice. If you're interested in how to use a degree wheel and a top dead center finder, have a look at episode 21. But for now, we're just gonna go ahead and fast forward through all of this. So while I had the degree wheel on, I went ahead and marked top dead center on the flywheel, and I also marked off the 26 degrees before top dead center. And I guess you're thinking, Jimbo, those marks are useless. And yeah, they are, unless you drill a hole in a cover and file in a nifty little pointer. Oh, and on the other side, I filed a little notch on the clutch to mark the 26 degree mark. And that's so we can do a quick repair if necessary. It ain't great, but it's better than nothing. Well, the engine bay is looking a little lonely. I say we drop in the 420 big block back in place. But before we do that, let's go through the list. Let's see, Honda. Loud exhaust. Pop bang. Red stripe on the steering wheel. Big block engine. Now folks, that can only mean one thing. Race car. Now we ain't screwing around. We got ourselves a street legal race car with a cement mixer engine. Booyah! And it's time we take things a little bit more serious. And as you can see, this is for race cars only. <laughs> I said we're gonna take things serious. <laughs> Well, sort of serious. Anyway, we need a new ignition switch for our race car, and this'll do the trick. Plus, it was dirt cheap. So what we got here is a master power switch, a warning light, and a push button for the starter. It's all very simple, and best of all, it's mounted on a simulated carbon fiber panel. The old ignition panel will need to be removed so we can wire in the new switch panel. The old panel houses the choke knob and a really crappy ignition switch. The panel itself is fiberglass with a lightweight carbon fiber sticker. Now the reason this has to go is, it's set up for a magneto ignition and it's not compatible with our fuel injection setup. 
So initially I was going to mount this race car panel on top of the old panel, but that would look kind of tacky with the extra holes and all. So I made a new fiberglass panel to mount the race car part to. Sort of no frills, but it'll work. Let's see how it looks all put together. Not too bad. So off camera I went ahead and wired the panel up. Now this is what I call a drop in panel. You see the harness was actually measured and trimmed so it fit the car perfectly. And that's not hard to do because there's only a few wires. So the master switch, the warning light and the starter button are all wired in and this is a simple circuit that provides power to the ECU, the starter solenoid and the warning light. The harness is partially covered with split loom and the rest is taped. Now I like to use Scotch 33 for taping harnesses, and yeah I know Project Farm did a test on a bunch of tapes, but at the end of the day I feel the Scotch brand is the best choice. We get power and ground for the ECU, plus a lead for the starter solenoid. Now on the other side we're set up for inline fuses to connect to the positive side of the battery, and of course a ground. All this in an easy to install package. Now let's see how it looks in the car. Not too bad. You guys getting that race car vibe? I am. This is going to be awesome. So for the ECU, I went ahead and fabricated an aluminum mounting panel. The ECU and the ignition module are attached with Velcro, and that's not too half-assed. I mean, that's how they put Subarus together, so it must be good. Now if you recall in episode 19, all the components for this system are pre-wired, and the only thing we need to connect is power and ground, plus an ignition trigger input. So for clean connections, we're going to be using this terminal block. Well. It's because I'm all out of wire nuts, scotch locks, and duct tape. Well, I guess I've run out of stuff to do, and now we can put the engine back in the car. We pretty much covered all our bases, and the rest will more or less be plug and play. I think now would be a good time to give a shout out to the episode 13 fan club. Word from the top brass is, we're going to finish episode 13, so hang in there. <laughs> well, that was random. Oh. And the last modification we needed to make was for both the narrow band oxygen sensor and the wide band oxygen sensor. I think initially we'll try the narrow band, and I'll show you why they suck. Then we can go with the wide band. So you can see the narrow band sensor right here, and for now I have the wide band port blocked off. The throttle body adopter is next. This is something we fabricated in episode 21. It's pretty beefy, but at some point our street legal race car will be getting forced induction, and I think this part will work just fine. And right here you can see where I drilled the hole in the engine cover so we can check the ignition timing. Luckily I managed to find a rubber plug to cover the hole with. The throttle body is next. This throttle body uses an O-ring on the flange side, and it should be okay for now. I usually have a plan put together as far as parts go, but unfortunately I forgot the throttle cable and the air filter. I do have them on order, but for now we're going to have to deal with my mistake. So off camera I fabricated some aluminum spacers to hold up the ECU panel. And right here is where we mounted the fuel pump. The location was picked on the wire length, and it works out to be a perfect spot. It sits slightly lower than the fuel tank, so it shouldn't have any problems. The ECU panel slides right into place like a genuine Honda part. Now this was the best location I could find, and well, it ain't perfect. My only concern is water issues, and for the most part the car is always garage, so I think we'll be okay. Aside from the power ground and ignition trigger, the rest of the harness is plug and play, and that really makes a difference. Looks like Jimbo needs a shave. Wait, I'm Jimbo. Who's that guy? Whatever. That guy needs to shave. Let's look at the fuel pump for a moment. Now that's the supply line, that's the return line, and this is the high pressure line. Now according to the seller's eBay ad, the fuel pump puts out 3 bar as far as pressure goes, and that works out to be 43.5 PSI, or 300 kilopascals for the metric crowd. Who uses bar? So the ECU is all wired up, and off camera I attached the power and ground cables. The ignition trigger is still set up with the open builds connector and has a 1 kilo ohm resistor going from the power to the signal line and that provides the pull up. At some point we'll clean this up. Now if you're interested, you can watch episode 19 to see how all of this is wired. The ignition coil got mounted to the engine block and the wire from the ECU was attached. The other wire on the coil was grounded to the engine block. Looks like the only thing left to plug in is the fuel injector, but before we do that I want to prime the fuel system. And of course we don't have a throttle cable yet. 
It's about time we put some fuel in the tank and do a systems check. And that should be enough for now. So this is the high pressure fuel line that's supposed to go to the fuel injector. And this is the return line. I figure we'll loop them back to the fuel tank and cycle the fuel pump to prime the system. So if we did everything right, when I turn the power on to the ECU, the fuel pump should turn on and run for a few seconds and then shut off. Let's see if that's true. Yep, and it seems to work just fine. So now we have the high pressure fuel line connected to the injector and we have it nicely secured. I left plenty of wiggle room because the drivetrain does move back and forth and that's totally normal. The governor is no longer functional and we've got it tied back with a spring so it can still move. So let's connect the last wire and see if this thing will start. Well, for me it'll take a little bit longer because the battery needs to be charged, but for you folks, we're only moments away. Now here I'm cycling the fuel pump a few times to pressurize the system. I guess I'll borrow a phrase from Derek over at Vice Grip Garage. Bring the thunder! Alright, well it did fire, but the gas cap bouncing around got me concerned, and I spent about two minutes looking for the source of the noise. Anyway, since we don't have a throttle cable, I rigged up some wires to jump the solenoid, and I'm gonna have to hand throttle the engine. Now I'm pretty sure some of you folks can tell right away that the engine's running really rich, but the problem is I got my hands full, and if I let go of the throttle, the engine will stall. We will get into all the setup details and basic tuning in the next video, but basically all I did was adjust the VE numbers to a more reasonable value, and the engine started to run really good. Now here's a cold start with the throttle closed. And what we're hearing here is the engine's running really rich, and that's due to the after start enrichment. But that's no big deal, all this stuff can be adjusted with a laptop computer. Most of the basic tuning can be done by ear, however the performance stuff is going to be a lot more complicated. Fascinating. Jimbo, it would appear this fuel injection system is complete. So one of the best kept secrets on this channel is my recipe for making chicken parfait and the fact that our street legal race car has four flat tires. Yeah, it's amazing what a little air can do when the camera's running. Anyway, it takes a few days for the tires to go flat and that's getting annoying. Now some of you folks have suggested that I run four space saver spare tires on the car to improve fuel economy and high speed performance. And that might be good for an experiment, but I think the rest of the time I should run a set of tires that were engineered for this car. Now the folks over at the Honda Insight Forum say the Brigstone RE92 low rolling resistance tire is the only way to go. They report better fuel economy and blah 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 blah. Now these tires ain't cheap and they run about twice the price of a generic tire, so I had to do some shopping around. Now amazingly enough, Tire Rack was the most expensive and Costco had the best price. Now you guys can do what you want, 
but this channel's on a tight budget and we can sure appreciate a good deal. So before I could do the fuel injection upgrade, I needed to evaluate these tires. So I spent an entire Sunday driving around and collecting data. Well, these tires don't improve a fuel economy, nor do they hurt the fuel economy. The before and after numbers remain the same. As far as top speed goes, well, they don't seem to help. Now keep in mind I'm using a GPS speedometer, so any difference in tire size is irrelevant. The bottom line is, for this car the tires don't make a difference, except these tires will actually hold air, and that's good enough. In the next few episodes where we evaluate performance of the EFI, we can more or less factor out the tires if we see any performance gains. Hey, and a big thanks to Scott Kolbeck for the new door handle. Along with YouTube videos on first-gen insight repairs, Scott also makes these awesome belly pans. Scott's YouTube channel, aptly enough, is called Scott Kolbeck. Check it out if you own one of these cars. It's a great resource for repair information. Depending on your skill set, I would say the easy part of the EFI swap is finished, and next comes the tough job of tuning the engine. And that's in the next episode, so you don't want to miss any of that.